So um, this is our um, fourth video for the for the lecture, but second to last one for unit two of week one, where we're talking about Matsu Obasho's Narrow Road to Oku, namely a discussion of the haiku itself, right? And, and from there, the haibun, which is the form that the uh, Narrow Road to Oku is written in, but we'll get around to that um, uh, uh, as we go, right? The haiku is kind of a quintessential part of this because it's so formative to how uh, the, uh, the haibun has come to be formed. It's a necessary function of it, right? Um, so let's kind of work through it from there, right? So what's the haiku, right? You, you ask the average um, English speaker from the West, and it's, oh, it's a poem where it's 575 five and it doesn't have to rhyme. Yes, right? As we've come to understand it in English, like kind of, right? Um, the simplicity of that analog is, it's not even debatable. It's, it's a very ineffective um, kind of translation of the concept, but um, some argue it's as close as we can get. Uh, I don't necessarily agree on all points, but we'll get to some that it it might hold true that there's just no analog. But um, it's definitely something that demonstrates what can be very difficult on a cultural and language level for translating um, literature in form, like the lyric work of poetry. Okay, so basic form, right? That five seven five thing. Yes, right? 575 is correct. Most of you will have probably assumed, yes, 575 syllables. Syllables do not exist as such in Japanese poetics, right? Um, and what's more, um, syllables themselves are tricky to talk about, even in um, English and Western poetics, right? Um, hopefully you had enough exposure uh, to uh, to poetry in high school to have at least heard of iambic pentameter, probably in relation to Shakespeare, right? Or the uh, or or some such, right? If not, right, um, it is a specific description of exactly how um, a rhyme line reads in a particular format of repeating uh, uh, sonic things that we call poetic feet, right? Sonic units, right? That are often made up of multiple syllables in English, a poetic foot, that, uh, but not necessarily, sometimes they're single syllable foot, but we'll get to that uh, way down the line. It's not particularly relevant here. Um, but um, necessarily, um, they uh, dictate. The first part of that phrase, iambic pentameter, dictates what the foot looks like and how it's pronounced, right? Or stressed more accurately. So unstressed stress, a rising foot, right? And I am. So hello, right? Any any sort of down up, down up, down up. Each one of those down ups is an I am, right? Pentameter, right? Meter, metric, foot, right? So walking, right? Multiple feet, right? Um, Penta, surprise, means five, right? Five iams to a line, iambic pentameter, right? Doesn't exactly qualify the same in Japan. Um, so when we speak to Japanese and Japanese, Japanese poetics, the Japanese poetic foot is viewed very differently because if you have any understanding of how Japanese is both written and said, right? Um, there's a whole bunch of different layers to it, right? We talk very often about how um, English is probably one of the hardest, if not the hardest, language to learn because none of the rules make sense and everything breaks the rules. Japanese um, isn't actually that altogether difficult to learn. Um, I spent a very long time doing so. Um, but um, the the kind of bigger um, thing that like I notice in my own studies and often comes up is that um, it's actually the fact that there are many systems at place that have that are very regulated and, and stick to the rules. And it becomes um, daunting, um, much like it often does in any foreign language that you're first learning, to kind of overcome them and, and come to understand them, okay? Um, so in Japanese poetics, we have uh, two, two other terms that have been kind of misequivocated to the idea of syllables. And I'm going to give you some examples of when they don't match up, okay? Um, the first one is on, right? So sounds, po like literal units of sound, right? Um, in English, we immediately went, oh, sound, like a single unit. So you mean like a syllable? Not quite, right? So 
for example, right, um, the best, the, the, the easy examples, right, you can have a word, Nagasaki, right? Nagasaki, four syllables when we say it in English, right? Coincidentally, in Japanese, it does have four units of sound, right? Um, but one of the bigger differences, and it's not always the case in English when this happens, so it's, this is where the, the difficulties start to show up. When we have things like diphthongs in English, like where the vowel changes in the middle, um, like uh, Tokyo, right, where it's O, the O to the U sound, right? That is an example, right? Tokyo, right? In Japanese, it's to u ki o, right? So it's actually, sorry, it's four, right? Tokyo, right? So there's an OU diphthong on each of those O's, despite there not being one. When you write up the on for that, it is four units of sound. It's four on for two syllables, right? You can have three, right? So Osaka, right? So O-S-A-K-A, -A, three syllables, Osaka in Japanese, Osaka, Osaka, right? Four, on, right? Then we get into another thing that's kind of even more directly equivalent to our idea of poetic feet. It's this idea of ji or ji that are um, essentially equivalent to that, but it's the idea of like specific characters that encompass a sound or a, a few sounds, right? So like I said before, the I am, the short long, right? Rather than being focused on the stress on stress in the in the Jap Japanese prosody, which is prosody is the kind of the, the study of the poetics, right? Um, it's focused on like the, the sounds and the order and the number they come in. This symbol means these sounds, right? Um, this character stands for that. Um, in English, they're often just called characters, which isn't necessarily correct. But again, you're starting to notice there are parallels in the language that don't necessarily exist, and we have to go to the closest thing we can work with. This is very much the work of the translator, and this is even before we're getting to, the, to looking at words on the page and translating the, the, the literature. This is just the reality of the differences between languages can be very, very complicating, right? This idea doesn't have a direct parallel here, so we have to find the closest thing, which is fine, and what we have to do to translate, but as McGrath kind of knows in, in the, the first week and how you've probably started to realize and have heard many times in the past the idea that something is lost in translation it's what is missing in that difference right haiku i think is probably one of the best examples for demonstrating what can be lost in translation or rather um, the immense hurdle that can come from translation so haiku five seven five on right cool five sounds seven sounds five sounds English, closest we got is syllables. Cool, we'll use that, right? Um, now we get to another thing that is usually the biggest hurdle for a translation into Japanese. There are two concepts that exist in the haiku that do a lot of work. So like what a lot of people um, view haiku is kind of like, in, in English, it's almost like popcorn poetry, right? It's like the first kind of poem you have a kid write because it's easy and it's short and it doesn't have to rhyme. Cool, those are all really good things for teaching someone a poetic form, right? Um, the rules are very simple and understandable. It doesn't have to rhyme. Rhyming is complicated and it's way more complicated to do in a way that is isn't incredibly irritating to read, right? I'm sure you understand that from going back to reading a lot of classic poetry, right? But um, a lot of the haiku is actually about this idea of like the economy of space, right? You do not have a lot of, of, of banked words, right? Of economy of words to be able to say a whole bunch of things. You cannot expound and explain very well in a haiku. Because uh, that poem has places to be, and it's got to go to that next line of seven, and uh-oh, you're turning the corner already to the last line of five, and hopefully you've got the idea across in a way that connects, right? Um, to accomplish this, um, there is a kind of cultural, lit literary, and linguistic shorthand that helps us do this in these two functions, right? There's kireji, right? Cutting words, as they're often called in English, right? Right? 
Um, these do not translate, right? So we run into some really big damn uh, complications with this, right? Where it's just, what do I do with these things? They're, they're like, they're shorthand signals, oftentimes for a mood, right? So, well, damn, right? You run into a whole bunch of people who try to translate these in different ways. They either try and turn them into an adjective or an adverb to just straight up tell you what the mood is, mood is right? Um, oftentimes, perhaps interestingly, uh, they turn into punctuation, which in and of itself can become very vague, right? So it either becomes really blunt and loses the nuance of the poetics, or it becomes incredibly vague and also loses the nuance of the poetics, right? Um, but at least sounds more mystical, right? Or somehow uh, bigger than it is. So it's up to the uh, translator to figure it out, okay? Um, there are a couple examples. Um, classically, in the, 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 the renku, right? The, like, the chained haikus going on and on, right? And in uh, the Renga, which is similar, there are there were kind of like an, a traditional pack. They were like, don't worry, if you see any of these 18 things, you know what the poem wants you to think in this exact moment. So you have ka, right, which shows up in spoken Japanese, like ogenki desu ka, right, which is how are you doing, right? Ka means I'm asking you a question. There are no question marks in Japanese. It'll just have a period, but it has ka at the end of it. So you know, question, right? Um... That can show up in like the first line, or maybe the second line, right? Um, at the end of some, at the end of a phrase, right? Or it can show up in the middle of the line at the end of a phrase, right? It just it, oh, so this poem is about wonder and questioning. Okay, you know, kana, right? Which can be at the end of the poem, and it's literally just a shorthand for the way I'm saying this shows that like I'm in wonder or awe of what I'm looking at just like oh like this is beautiful like I'm I'm engrossed in this it's wonderful right just amazement and wonder right um uh kitty which so a kind of an exclamatory thing in the past perfect right so um that can be tricky because even then connections to which verb tenses necessarily appear in languages people just assume like well somebody always has to be able to talk uh about an antecedent that happened at an you know is contextual to happening at a time in the past so like we had we had arrived or they had done this thing right well it depends, right? You get into specific languages and they have different understandings of time that go to cultural norms. Um, there's a very famous sort of thing where um, there are a couple languages, even uh, tribal languages in, in Africa that have been studied that don't have a word for I, right? So, uh, and things of that sort, right? These kind of things that you're like, well, how the hell do you translate that? Well, good luck. That's what you study and you do a lot of research and you do your best with. This is what translators grapple with, right? So, cool. It's in the. Uh, it indicates the past perfect, so it's something that had happened before this thing happened in the past. Something that had been completed before this moment. It was contextual to this past thing. And it's an exclamation. Cool, right? I guess we'll just... Make something be in the past perfect or the blue perfect when we when we get to it in the English translation. Cool. So we can fix that with with conjugation, hopefully. But we still have to make it exclamatory. So eh, we might be able to grapple with that, but it's hard, right? And then we get ramu or ran, right? Which probability it, it indicates probability, right? Like just. What the hell, right? Like, maybe? Is that, are we going to use maybe or should or might or any of those sort of objective, like, it may happen or it may not sort of words? Maybe? And then which one do we pick? Which one is intended? Oh, we have to decide. Translation is difficult, right? Um, and there are many, 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 many more, right? There's things that indicate present perfect. There's one that indicate emphasis, right? The reason they're called... Uh, Kireji or cutting words is the idea that when they happen, they kind of split the poem, right? And they encourage you to look at the two pieces of the poem in relation to each other. Um, 
disparate pieces as part of a whole is not only just a common literary thing for people to talk about, it's also very much uh, a concern of a great number of Japanese art forms. Um, so definitely of interest, okay? Um, so that's our first one, Kideji. The really, really hard ones to translate, right? Um, and that we don't have a direct equal to. Then we get to Kigo, right? Season words, okay? So if you look back a few videos, I mentioned that we're going to talk about why the frog is, is the thing that everyone focuses on in that poem I had you guys look at. Uh, Basho's most famous haiku and probably the most famous haiku in the world in that early first unit thing, right? Why are there a bunch of contests about a frog? Is it just because he wrote about the frog? No, right? Very much like I explained, there's contests to do the six word stories like uh, Hemingway. They're not called baby, you know, they're not like everyone writes stories about baby shoes. Those probably exist, right? But it's much more, let's do something in the spirit of this, in six words, right? How can we see as much as possible in as little space as possible? So, Kigo, season words. They are words that denote a specific time, right? Um, and they're called season words because it's usually like a time of year, right? This has a whole bunch of cultural stuff to unpack about it, okay? Um, and it's inherently a cultural familiarity, right? So... Frogs mean summer, right? Mean heat, water, the, all that sort of thing. Cool. The frog is a kiko. It means this time of year. We have related to it. It's spring or it's summer. It's warm out. The sun's out. The frogs are jumping. It's not winter when they're frozen and asleep in the ground or in the pond, right? The frog is moving. There are, you know, the, the water is fluid. The frog itself is the season word. It denotes a warm season, the summer, okay? Um, these do not often show up in English language haiku. It's not that they don't always, and there are some people who I think master them in super interesting ways. Um, David Trinidad has a whole bunch of really hilarious haiku that are called reruns that are all specifically brought from language from different uh, literal reruns of old TV. You know, and like, I don't remember the specific one, but it's like, oh, like Batman and Robin fighting the Joker, bam, right? And it's like, okay, so like, bam is almost like the cutting word because it's supposed to be exciting. So there's kind of a kid AG. And then the fact that we're talking about, you know, this specific era, like the Batman TV show. Oh, you mean the one from like the, the, the 60s? Okay, so you've put us in a place in time, right? It's got its foot in the door of these concepts and plays with them in interesting ways, right? Um, these are difficult to translate because it, you show the frog poem to someone in English, right? And you're like, why is this so, why do you think this is so culturally relevant? Well, like, I don't know, I guess it's pretty, but like, but why? It's like three lines about a frog jumping in the water <coughs> and it makes a noise or it splashes, or however it, the translator decides to work with it. Who cares when you first look at it? Well, this helps to explain why these things matter so much, right? So then it becomes a series of competitions, essentially writing haiku in the spirit of, of crystallizing the moment of, of, of summer, right? Or of spring, or of this exact instant moment and the feeling you're supposed to have about it through the frog poem, right? We write frog poems because the frog is the best, right? It's the, it is the season word we're all gonna use to, to denote this time of year, right? So because of that, a lot of those words are culturally relevant, right? Um, there are, if you want like the best indication of it, like talk to someone who's not from the United States, right? And does not interact often online with people from the United States and mention some like obscure, stupid government holiday that we all get off of work. And they're like, well, why? Right? Like, they have no reference for it. But if, you know, to someone in the United States and you're like, oh, Labor Day, right? Labor Day is a totally different time of year in other countries that have Labor Days, right? In the US, we just had it. That's Labor Day, right? When's Memorial Day? Oh, okay, well, depending on which country it is memorializing which war, it'll be on a specific day. Stuff like that. Things all have cultural context that anchor them in time, which makes Kigo difficult because, you, again, you show someone the frog poem. Why is this important, 
well, okay, we need to think about this. Like, which one of these words is doing this function, do we think? Right, well, the pond is here, and there's this. We can read the context and come to understand. Ah, so it's this time of year. So we're in a scene of this, and it indicates all of the symbolic baggage that comes with that time of year. Right? What does summer mean, right? Um, if we read a poem and a poet mentioned summer, right? Like, there's so many turns of phrase to come with it. The summertime of youth. Oh, it's hopeful and, and forward and warm and bright and eager and moving forward and active, right? All of those things that come from summer also have an equivalency in the, the, the culture that, in, in Japanese culture, that relate to the Kigo of the frog implying summer, which then unpacks this whole other thing. And then we'll have a Kireji in there that says, for example, you could have, oh, we've unpacked summer, and then, oh, we've got... This, uh, you know, we've got ka, so we're asking a question um, to this moment, right? Or asking a question about it. Or, ah, yes, the, the appropriate suffix is here to tell us that we have a bit of wonder. So we've seen this crystallized moment of summer in, in existence and just we're, we're flushed with wonder, witnessing the beauty of summer, right? Um, very much, right, this idea of uh, how these words work and how they relate namely kigo in their relation to usually being aspects of the environment or nature that tie us to a specific time and the environment therein um, relates back to how often haiku reflects on nature and things like because um, it's a very kind of traditionally shintoist vibe shinto and buddhist in both order um, shinto is kind of like a historical um, traditional faith of japan has very very strong connections to the natural right that the kami the spirits the gods exist in the uh in the natural world around us in in the small and the large and the in the um very exemplary and strange monument of nature to the most basic thing right um so when you go and you sit at a pond and watch the frog you know like that reverence for moments in nature and things from nature is a very cultural thing, right? That we see come up again in other cultures, of course, the Romantics love nature in, in Western lit, right? But that specific relation to it and how they're looking at it is very quintessentially Japanese, right? So we run into this difficulty in translation, right? So we've gone through all of this with the haiku, you know? Uh, what on are, why they're not the same as syllables, what are cutting words, kirechi, what are kigo, right? How all of this ties into a cultural understanding and linguistic differences that do not easily translate to English. And then we give an entire book of them with prose on top of it to make it even more complicated to Donald Keane, who did a whole bunch of studying and is very well read in Japanese and in culture and said, and he said, I think this book is amazing and should be translated in this way. And I'm going to go through and translate it with our current understanding of the language. Because there's one extra level that, that, that differentiates a difficulty in translation that we're going to talk about in our last section, which is on the book in particular.